So the Dutch police and some international help took down two major info stealers, Redline and Meta Stealer. And it's pretty interesting. Let's talk about it. Today, we are facing an unprecedented array of data breaches, hacking attempts, and surges in digital crime. Why is there such a widespread amount and how little is noticed in our everyday lives? Malware, dark sites, brute forcing, zero days, script kitties, and nation state hackers are all on the rise. Learn more about the threats we face and gain a bit more knowledge than yesterday. Hey everyone, another episode of Exploit Brokers is coming to you now. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Exploit Brokers. I'll be your host, Laudo. If you could please do me a favor, hit that like, subscribe, and the bell notification icon if you're on YouTube. If you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a follow and a review, a positive review if you would. It would greatly help the channel and I'd appreciate it greatly. With that, let's jump into the story. So guys, in an article by the Hacker News, Dutch police disrupt major info stealers, Redline and Meta Stealer in Operation Magnus. The Dutch National Police, along with international partners, have announced the disruption of the infrastructure powering two information stealers tracked as Redline and Meta Stealer. So info stealers, for my audience who may or may not be aware, is essentially a piece of malware that when it gets installed onto a machine, it does what the name kind of implies. It tries to steal information from passwords, cookies, maybe crypto wallets, anything that could be essentially exfiltrated back to the hackers in question for some kind of financial gain. Continuing on with the article, the takedown, which took place on October 28th, 2024, is a result of an international law enforcement task force codenamed Operation Magnus that involved authorities from the US, the UK, Belgium, Portugal, and Australia. And that's something we're seeing kind of more and more often, right? You have because a lot of these hackers operate on a very international basis, because a lot of the victims, right, anything that's connected to the internet doesn't necessarily have just one location. Because a lot of the victims span multiple countries, multiple parts of the world, it kind of makes sense that a lot of international authorities come together to kind of bring down criminal infrastructure that's being created by a lot of these cyber criminals. So here in this case, you know, some pretty big ones, the US and the UK, and then Belgium, Portugal, and Australia. And for them to kind of all pool the resources, you can assume that the task force is probably pretty powerful on it. So continue forward. Eurojust, in a statement published today, said the operation led to the shutdown of three servers in the Netherlands and the confiscation of two domains. In total, over 1,200 servers in dozens of countries are estimated to have been running the malware. So this is kind of where where it's the interesting part if you're talking about what they can shut down the fact that it's just three servers and two domains for a thousand two hundred servers every cyber criminal operation kind of has different ways that they scale their infrastructure i mean from from an interesting logistics standpoint right if you have a thousand two hundred servers in dozens of countries that are running the malware and they're all contacting three command and control servers that I've, I've seen some malware that has some really cool resistance features and they have, you know, fallbacks and other stuff. So this one seemed to have been a little bit more centralized. So continue forward. As part of the efforts, one administrator has been charged by the U.S. authorities and two people have been arrested by the Belgian police. The police said, adding one of them has since been released while the others remain in custody. The U.S. Department of Justice, the date, the DOJ, has charged Maxim Rudimentov, one of the Redline Stealers developers and administrators with access device fraud, conspiracy to commit computer intrusion, and money laundering. If convicted, he faces a maximum penalty of 30 years in prison. Rudimentov regularly accessed and managed the infrastructure of Redline Info Stealer, was associated with various cryptocurrency accounts used to receive and launder payments, and was in possession of Redline malware. So, that's something else that I've been seeing a lot of these info stealers and other cyber criminals have been using on this on the crypto side. So kind of shifting gears for a second, talking a bit more of the infrastructure side. A lot of crypto stealers or info stealers that steal crypto and just a lot of criminal organizations who tend to use crypto for illicit means tend to wash or launder their money the same way that you would see actual credit cards 
or actual cash getting laundered in when you have a, you know, a physical kind of criminal organization. So a lot of the cryptocurrencies go into wallets, which then get dispersed into other wallets and kind of creating this fake paper trail to make it seem like the money has gone elsewhere. The thing about crypto is it's a public ledger, right? So you can keep tracking this down for a while. Um, where it got kind of complicated with that kind of scheme is I know that there was a couple of uh, column washers where you would send a transaction, a crypto transaction into the washer and they would match other similar amounts and similar timing and then they would swap them out to make it harder to kind of track where it was going. I believe there have been some of those washers have been shut down. I don't know how many of them are still operational. That's something I'll probably try to make on a future episode, but something that's kind of interesting on that front nonetheless, right? So here it seems like they were just sending the assets to one wallet and then that wallet was being sent out to a few other wallets. So that kind of makes it easier to determine who holds that wallet. Investigation into the technical infrastructure of the info stealers began a year ago based on a tip from a cybersecurity company, ESET, that the servers are located in the Netherlands. Among the data seized include usernames, passwords, IP addresses, timestamp, registration dates, and the source code of both Steeler Malware. In tandem, several Telegram accounts associated with the Steeler Malware have been taken offline. Further investigation into their customers is ongoing. And in case y'all haven't seen the news recently, I know the Telegram CEO or something like that got into some hot water. I believe it was the CEO. And because of that, Telegram has become a bigger target for law enforcement to go after these groups because that's where a lot of i'm not going to say a lot of criminal organizations are on telegram but there seems to be an overwhelming amount of criminals using whether it's hackers or otherwise using telegram to essentially distribute information talk have groups right and think about telegram is i believe telegram has some encryption but it's open i i don't want to get too much in details i gotta look that up now, the InfoStealer's Redline and MetaStealer were offered to customers via these groups. Dutch law enforcement officials said until recently, Telegram was a service where criminals felt untouchable and anonymous. This action has shown that this is no longer the case. It's worth noting that the MetaStealer target as part of Operation Magnus is different from the MetaStealer malware that's known to target macOS devices. And yeah, so when we're talking about the Redline and MetaStealer, MetaStealer here is the Windows version or the Windows malware. Um, not to say that they're similar, but it's specifically the Windows MetaStealer. Now, a lot of this, um, a lot of this kind of runs into the ransomware as a service or malware as a service, which toward the end of the article talks about. But that's something that I think is kind of interesting to bring up. Because just as we're seeing the software as a servicification, that's, yeah, let's go with that, of a lot of softwares, things, you know, like legitimate softwares, we're also seeing the malicious side of the world, the malware, the ransomware side of the world kind of take a similar thing, right? Because if you can collect any kind of monthly, call it a monthly subscription from your user base, whether that's a legitimate or illegitimate business, then you can keep operating, right? And it becomes more profitable for the for the company that's selling the service. In this case, we're seeing malware as a service, ransomware as a service, a lot of these as a service models, which essentially allow the malicious developers to keep building it out, making it better, and they're getting a nice payday from it. Because the more money there is for them, the more money that they can use to just fund their lifestyle, fund their operations, maybe get other malicious developers on board. It runs the same way that you would any kind of normal business, right? If a business makes money, there's no reason why you wouldn't get some of that money and try to put more into it to get more money out of it or to improve it. And of course, you're uh, if legit, in normal and legitimate businesses, you'll take some money off the top for yourself. I'm pretty sure that's what these guys are doing as well. And it's just interesting to see the legitimate, the actual business world trickle down into the malware world could even be vice versa. But it's interesting. We're seeing that with ransomware. We're seeing that with malware here, at least um, the law enforcement agencies were able to take Operation Magnus off or they were able to use Operation Magnus to take off these two info stealers because I mean, 
a lot of the people who tend to fall for info stealers and stuff like that yeah you do have a lot of businesses that fall for it but you also tend to have a lot of people who don't have a lot of money falling for info stealers and other kinds of malware and it's kind of a shame you know you see a lot of people get taken advantage of by uh malware and viruses and stuff like that but hey here's a win uh for the good guys and a win for uh taking down as much malware as possible this was a bit of a shorter episode i want to thank you for tuning in and i will catch you in the next one